literacy, practical experience, activism, and analysis has resulted in a number of awards and honors, including the Volvo Environment Prize for the work on women's population and development, and honorary doctorates from the universities of Anglia, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, the Open University of UK, the University of Sussex, and the University of Professor Sen's national and international work has helped to advance gender equity and women's human rights and to shape the global paradigm shift on population policies and programs in women's health. It is now my great pleasure to invite Professor Sen to present her lecture on challenges to global advocacy, women's rights, ICTD, Beijing, and the post-2015 development agenda. Please welcome Professor Lee Sen. But what we see as 
as the uh, broad texture of what we call the fierce new world that we all live in. Um, the early 21st century has been marked globally by, as we all know, the war on terror and the financial and economic crisis. Beneath these headlines, however, lie other phenomena of no less importance. Climate change, species die-offs, and a host of related ecological crises, as well as a backlash against very real advances towards social justice and human rights for all that we um, both saw in reality and saw in promise by the end of the previous um, century. Um, even deeper beneath the surface lies the drastic transformation of the world of work towards flexibility and precariousness. What uh, Professor Guy Standing, who worked for many years at the International Labour Organization, uh, has called the rise of um, the the work, not the proletariat, but the precariat. Um, so people whose increasingly whose living is precarious. It's just the likelihood, likelihood of having and holding what we would think of as a regular job um, over your lifetime um, has been significantly reduced for very large numbers of, um, of people. Um, so the world of work has changed towards flexibility and precariousness that shapes what is possible and probable by way of social policies as well. A fierce new world has been born, therefore, full of shaken premises, complicated contradictions, serious fractures in social contracts, severe backlashes, broken promises, and uncertain outcomes for the world's peoples. Um, so, um, in our work in Dawn, um, we're not as pessimistic as that paragraph um, sounds like. Uh, we do believe that it encapsulates a very important part of the reality of the world we live in. Um, at the same time, we do see forward movements in terms of both social justice and human rights, both things that I personally, in my work as an academic, um, um, interested in the political economy of development and in my role as an activist and advocate working with Dawn, um, very much believed, but also very much have seen and been part of in the last um, 20 to 30 years of Dawn's, um, of Dawn's existence. Now this, um, the title of the lecture, of today's lecture, is in some senses a very broad remit. Um, and I was speaking to Claire Smatter, how many people can I expect to be in the audience who know what all of that alphabet soup means? Um, ICPD, um, can I see a show of hands?
Um, but the last quarter of the 20th century, as most of us know, um, um, saw a new twist in globalization. Fiji, of course, in some sense, is a point where to take the long view, has been globalized since forever. Ever since and before, in debt labor, and when you know, the ships were sailing around, um, sailing ships going around the ocean, they kept sort of popping up against and around and between the Pacific Islands in different ways. But at least for uh, a couple of centuries, uh, Fiji has been very much part of the movement of peoples, uh, which of course um, uh, has shaped greatly the nature of your history and the nature of um, the society in which you live. So in some sense, one could argue that um, Fiji's globalization is nothing new to Fiji. Yet we do know that the globalization of the late 20th century, dating back, let's say, to about the early to middle 1970s, some people would date it a little earlier, depending upon uh, what technology you're looking at, um, saw a new twist in what we think of as globalization. And that is, of course, what's called financialization of the economy. Um, the rise of an entirely new um, financial, uh, financial sector, which from small beginnings um, in the 1970s, and you will find it hard to believe that in, when I was a graduate student, um, we still, there were no credit cards. And it took me the longest time to think that my money would disappear into some you know, black hole, never to be seen again, um, if I tried uh, playing around with those. It's the classic. Um, we wrote checks. There were certainly no computers. There was, we didn't even have fax machines at that time. Um, compute, uh, no personal computers. The computers we worked with were those big, noise-making things that sat in the machine all by themselves, um, combined power of a computer sitting at something about you know, the size of half of this hall would probably be a fraction of a fraction of what any one of our smartphones today, um, uh, today has. Um, it was a very different time and technology played certainly a huge role in opening up the possibility of the financialization that proceeded apace from the middle of the, the early to middle of the 1970s um, made it possible increasingly for the financial sector of the global economy to become a force in itself, um, not a handmaiden of the productive sector, not there to primarily service the productive sector, but in fact to act as the driving force for where the productive sector may go, may not go, may be possible to go, a driving force for bringing policies, shaping the nature of government policies, creating or limiting uh, the policy space, um, and altering forever the ways in which um, we think and act as uh, people who are concerned with issues of social justice, um, development, and um, human rights. Um, the, that, this era of financialization, um, as we all know, and we've become particularly aware of it, of course, because of the um, uh, much more than all the individual, regional, um, crises uh, that have been part of this financialization um, almost since the beginning, um, the crisis of 2008 um, has really dramatically affected just about everybody. I don't think there is a country that has been um, insulated from the effects in one way or the other of that, um, of that crisis. Special consequences for what governments can do, um, and special consequences, as I said, for how we think about human development and human rights. Um, one of the biggest, and I don't have, and I don't want to spend much time here talking about the financialization. I'm sure in the uh, we are part of the faculty business, and uh, 
um, uh, and uh, economics. So in some course or the other, um, I'm sure you will run up against this. But the um, but among the things, among the very important consequences for um, development of the financialization, um, one of the most important parts has been um, the continuous pressure to open up national um, economies for the free flows um, of money and finance. Um, that is to be able to have what in technical terms is called full capital convertibility. Um, you are far from it. Um, India is maybe a bit, as a country, maybe a bit closer to it, although we keep going back and forth because of the nervousness about what that full financial, full capital convertibility might mean. It basically would mean, it, for Fiji, if you want to think about it, and I have no clue what I'm talking about, it would basically mean um, your, the Fijian um, dollar would become freely convertible on the um, on open markets. Now, of course, we're very far from that. There's been really very good reasons why most developing countries have been very nervous about going anywhere near there because the economies are too fragile to deal with money flowing in and out um, as it pleases, which is what, in fact, full would, um, would allow. Even more so for a small economy, but actually even big economies like India cannot insulate themselves from uh, the impact of what a um, what capital convertibility of that kind um, could mean. Um, because if you have a, um, a crisis of some kind, um, like the 1997 crisis that, um, um, that devastated um, Southeast um, and East Asia, um, all the um, predators want their money out um, first. Um, and if the government tries at that point to stop them from doing that, there's huge pressure from the IMF, the So it means that the international creditors get first dips on repayment. Um, everything else follows after that. And in order to pay the international creditors, the government basically has to squeeze domestic um, credit. Where is that money going to come from? You know, you can't get blood out of a stone and you can't get money to pay because you're not going to pay international creditors in Fijian dollars. They get the US dollars. Um, so that blood is not going to come out of a stock. It's going to come out of warm living human bodies, which is essentially what happens in terms of the policies that then impact everything gets cut down in fiscal, fiscal space, so the government gets dramatically reduced. Um, and as it's being experienced in Greece right now, um, and in a few other countries in Europe, Spain, not so bad, but pretty bad um, at this point. Portugal teetering back and forth on the edges. So being a part of the European Union doesn't insulate you either from, uh, from this problem. It's exactly the same problem that occurs everywhere. And it's driven by that single force because um, that particular, uh, the free flows of money and capital mean that um, the, that um, those essentially international financial institutions, the banking sector, are very concerned with the need for currency and banking stability, low inflation so that what they bring in and take out stays at the fairly stable exchange rates. Um, and married to this then, because as fiscal space for government reduces, and the government says, sorry, no money available for um, cleaning up the water system and making sure everybody gets water supply. 
Uh, we just don't have the money. The answer is bringing the private sector. Um, and uh, the private sector will then come to the private sector's bottom line as something different, as we know. Um, they will provide clean water or anything else, uh, but for a price. Um, they're not there to do, um, to do charity uh, for anybody. And, you know, their shareholders are who they think they feel that they are responsible to. So the two, the opening, the financialization, privatization, all of these are sort of part of the same parcel, um, in a sense. And that parcel of policies has been with us, affects North and South, uh, rich and poor countries in fact, um, has been with us since what we what call the structural adjustment programs that began in the 1980s. Um, interestingly, the first structural adjustment programs were not done in developing countries. Um, they were in the United States and the United Kingdom um, under the so-called Reagan Thatcher revolution of that period. So they experimented with structural adjustment in their own um, context. So as I said, it's not particularly, um, um, doesn't discriminate in that sense between the North um, and the South. What has this meant for women's rights, which is the other side of what we are really interested in in today's lecture? And why I'm talking about the question is because in fact everything that is in the title of that lecture is actually connected to and embedded in these, um, in these processes. So what has it meant for women's rights in terms of economic rights, in terms of livelihoods and the ability to ensure that there's food on the table for your kids, um, that, um, you can, uh, that when someone falls sick, um, you can actually afford to pay or to pay for their health care or to take care of them. What does it mean for women's bodily autonomy and integrity? Um, the absence of violence against women and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And you might think that's a long connection. What is the connection between financialization and uh, violence against women and bodily integrity? Well, believe me, it's there. And it's not a minor connection at all. So it's, it is what we work on in Dawn. And I'll say a little bit more. As we, um, as we go forward. And how does all of this affect um, the political voice and participation by women towards the creation of more just and more um, equal, including gender equal um, societies? Now, as I said, um, probably the best way of thinking about how all of this um, works is to think in terms through Dawn's own intellectual history. And I'll give you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch um, of that. Um, our, um, if you go to our website, which at the moment is being reconfigured, so it's a bit of a mess, but I would still encourage you, if you're interested, to look there. Um, it, our, we work with a broad vision of social justice um, and a right to development, but with gender justice at the center of that, um, of that right. Um, and I could think in terms of, um, at the moment, for this evening, I would say three phases in our work. When we first began our work in 1984, um, we were in the middle of the early era of the first structural adjustment, the Washington Consensus, so-called, and the Reagan Thatcher era. It was also the era that was seeing the um, IMF and the World Bank, the two so-called Bretton Woods institutions, very strongly pushing for, um, uh, for what they call the Washington Consensus, but really the interest of the actual um, globalization of the kind that I uh, spoke about. So that in country after country, we found cutbacks in the name of fiscal discipline, um, some of which undoubtedly was needed. Um, but I'm not saying by any means that governments didn't need to do that. But the problem with financialization is two things. The solutions provided by the IMF um, all the time um, are always on the side of the creditor and never on the side of the debtor. All borrowing involves 
involves two parties to it, as we know. There's someone who lends and someone who borrows. Um, well, if something goes wrong with that loan, the creditor has to be as much as at fault as the debtor. You didn't do your due diligence well enough if you ended up by giving bad loans a loan that went back. So you cannot just blame the borrower. And of course in the South we know there's many things that are called obvious debt. So why would Citibank or the some you know back of now? Well they're lending there because they think that the shady dictator can ensure that always ensure that they get paid off. So when the shady dictator falls to a democratic movement and people say sorry, you know, this is an odious debt. Why do we, the shady dictator meanwhile, has stashed away millions in some Swiss bank account? Um, how are we liable um, to pay for this? What is it that we got out of this, uh, out of the foreign? Who is at fault? Do we say that the people of the borrowing country should forever have to tighten their belts in order to pay back the big banks that lend in this, in this way? And if you look at the nature of borrowing and the amount of odious, what's called odious debt that was created in the system um, and which, you know, the international financial system has been trying in multiple ways to control and is still nowhere near, um, uh, near controlling. It's a little bit like the question of the mortgage crisis in the United States following 2008. You can say that, as you know, the, the sort of cutting edge of that crisis was a tanking of the mortgage rates, so that there were lots and lots of home loans that went bad. And those home loans have been so-called securitized, so that people can borrow on top of the borrowing so that you had something like Ponzi schemes of all kinds sitting on top of, uh, on top of the borrowing. Um, when those started, sort of, when they were so overblown that in fact at some point everyone was watching lost confidence, as you know the whole system depends on confidence. Once confidence goes, it comes, starts crumbling like a pack of cards. When that happens and everybody starts saying, Bad borrowers, well, what were you as a bank doing, lending to very poor people, knowing very well what their income levels were, that they could not possibly pay this back in the way that you were asking, and then turning around. So whose fault is that? You tell people, look, you can borrow a new mortgage, you're going to pay for 30 years, and the rate of interest is so low, these are all the poor people who've never had a home in their lives. They will say, of course, I'll take the home, thank you very much. Um, but what are you doing as the people who should have done the due diligence when you were happy to push the loans at that time? So in a sense, it's the same kind of problem, but even worse, the solution that the International Monetary Fund pushes for, uh, that says pay off your foreign creditors first, is full of what um, in economics we call moral hazard. That means essentially you, you do something wrong and instead of getting punished for it, you get patted on the knuckles and told, okay, you know, too bad, carry on. If you're a bank that has lent badly and you recover all of your money or close to all of your money without even what's called a haircut in when a crisis, when a crisis happens in a country, what's to stop you from doing it again? Not even a scolding. Nobody punishes you. CEOs of financial institutions make billions in bonuses um, after the crisis. So it's full of what we call moral hazard. Moral hazard is when the response to a mistake creates no disincentive to making the same mistake over again. Um, if, you're not, if you don't yell at the kid who has broken your window, you think, oh wow, this, this, these guys are okay, they're cool, they don't mind having a few broken windows, so you know, it's fine. I can keep playing with uh, throwing stones in the windows a bit more, um, and no problem. It's pretty much the same kind of thing. So,
So it's bad from that perspective, from the perspective of the stability of the financial system itself, even if you're not concerned about what it does to development policy, um, it's bad policy. And there's Nobel Prize winning economists, Joseph Stiglitz, Paul Krugman, who are all an African concern and writing about this for, um, for a long time now, uh, but without yet being able to make headway against the power of institutions that move, literally move trillions in the flash of an eye. Um, uh, uh, trillions of dollars um, in the course of the day. Um, so, in 1984 to 1990, which was the early stage of structural adjustment and of the impact of financialization, um, it was also relatively early stages of this phase of the women's movement um, globally. Um, and, and the arguments that were being made at that time were what is called development, quality, and peace. And I think I need a piece of paper around the left. Does anyone have Just a uh, In any case, um, between 1984 and 1990, um, the um, Dodd's concern in that era of thinking about women's rights in terms of what used, what used to be called development, equality, and peace, most of what the women's movement globally was concerned about was equality. Dawn broke into the scene as a group from literally all over um, the South, the global South, to say, what's the point of an equal share of a poisoned pie? That if development itself is not working for people, how are we asking for a bigger share in what? What is it that we're asking for a bigger share of? So we need development itself. We need to engage. It's not enough for the women's movement to be talking about gender equality um, as though the environment within which we're talking about gender equality is really um, the macroeconomics doesn't matter to us. Uh, what's happening with ecology and the environment doesn't matter. And we look very narrowly at something called gender equality. Um, now we may think of that as old hat, and yes, we know that. Um, it was absolutely brand new at that time, in the sense that I think it really accounts for the kind of influence um, that, our, you know, the, um, um, that our thinking has had. So, in a sense, in that first phase, and I would say that first phase was a phase between 1984 and 1990, in the throes of structural adjustment, we were concerned about the debt crisis, the food crisis, and this was across so many countries. Um, and the growing signs of an environmental crisis. And we said all of these things shape the meaning of gender equality. At that time, we were not talking about human rights particularly. Um, but all of these will shape the meaning of gender equality and what will come to mean in practice for women and for men. Um, and therefore, we need to locate what we're saying within that context. Around 1990, however, the, um, the world was looking at a different era. First of all, the hard structural adjustment policies of the 1980s had set off so much of a backlash in so many countries, including big multilateral institutions like UNICEF, which was at the center of making an argument that we need an adjustment with the human face. You can't have this kind of devastating structural adjustment, which is wiping out whole generations from schooling, which is removing healthcare facilities for um, large numbers of people. We can't do that. We need to see where the human face can come in in this. So by 1990, there was much more of a concern about how that human face could happen, and as well as at the same time, a recognition of the importance of the environmental crisis. We were two years away from the 1992 UN conference on environment and development held in Rio, which is the big conference that has set most of our concerns, thinking, and agenda 
for sustainable development in the period since 1992. We were three years away from the big Vienna conference on human rights, um, which was the first UN conference where it was explicitly recognized that women's rights are human rights. So human rights finally sort of comes onto the scene but only around the early 1990s. And this was important because up until then, 40, 48 years or whatever it was, after the uh, signing of the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human, right, human Rights, the founding document for human rights, the UDHR, um, it was always thought that you didn't need to worry about that. When, we, when the UDHR speaks about men, it speaks about everybody. Um, it doesn't mean... Um, but um, it was women's advocates who said, sorry, there are specifics to women's human rights that need to be explicitly recognized. Um, and it was also the first conference at which violence against women was explicitly recognized as a violation of human rights. Now, let us set this recognition of violence against women within, within um, the context of how governments and multilateral agencies tended up until that time to think about human rights. You had the North, or as it used to be called then the West, or the First World, um, that largely would speak about civil and political rights. So rights against arbitrary detention, against torture, you know, freedom of expression, uh, the freedom to form political parties, to be, uh, to exercise um, voting rights and so on. That was what the North would speak about, largely about civil and political rights of the individual. And the South kept talking about economic, social and cultural rights. So do people have enough food on the table? Do they have poverty, um, hunger, um, um, health, education, um, and so on? As well as cultural rights, including what much later on became the basis for talking about the rights of indigenous people um, and of uh, people with different kinds of identities um, and identifications. Neither of them, neither of these sides up until that time recognized that they might be a twist here in what these might mean for women. Or the extent to which violence against women, in fact, um, cuts across all nations, all classes, all boundaries, and is a universal problem almost everywhere. I should say everywhere. It's almost is not quite a, um, I've yet to see a society where it's not a problem. Um, and unless it is explicitly recognized as a human right, nobody will ever do anything serious about it. Now what's different about this human right is that uh, is about re the recognition of this right as a human right is that all other rights like all human rights, there are rights holders and duty bearers. That is, every right has a duty, implies a duty for somebody else. And most, in most of these, citizens are people, ordinary people are the rights holders. And states or governments are viewed as the duty bearers. It's their responsibility to ensure that you know, there's freedom on the there's safety on the streets. It's their it's their responsibility to ensure um, education for children and so on and so forth. For the first time, with the recognition of women's um, of violence against women as a violation of human rights, you get the recognition where rights holders and duty bearers are in fact made themselves be in the community. Um, that it's not only states or big non-state actors that we violate human rights. It's partners within families. 
Most violence against women happens not randomly from a random stranger, but in fact the bulk of it overwhelmingly is by known people, often within the often within the home, and quite often within neighborhoods and communities. So violators and perpetrators are not, um, you know, a big institution somewhere that is not doing its job. So for the first time we get an extension of the human rights agenda which recognizes that in a major way we may get both rights holders and duty bearers sitting within the community itself um, rather than sitting far away. Of course there's other elements to it, violence during conflict, violence, um, um, other kinds of violence where, which are um, the normal sort of um, violation against human rights. Um, and then after Vienna, which brought about this recognition, we had a quick succession. In 1994 and 1995, the two conferences that are named in the title uh, of today's talk. The 1994 conference, which is the Conference on Population and Development, held in Cairo um, in 1994, and 1995, which is of course the Fourth World Conference on Women, held in Beijing. And both of these, in fact, um, took what had happened in Vienna and ran with it. Um, they sort of expanded the boundaries of what we were thinking about. Cairo basically completely turned around and created a whole new paradigm for thinking about population policies and said that we need to move from where we keep thinking about population policies as policies to control the growth of population to where it becomes more health and human rights based. And Beijing, of course, the conference, the Fourth World Conference on Women, uh, which set forward a 20-year platform for action um, along 12 themes, which included everything from education and health to labor um, um, and employment, along 12 different themes, which in fact then has shaped how we thought about, um, about the women's agenda. Dawn, of course, was in the thick of all of it. Um, as the global organization that had talked about the need to be engaged in this, um, we were very much part of these um, conferences and we had been to shape um, the outcome of these conferences. Um, we were also part of the renewed shaping of uh, women's human rights agenda more broadly um, and also with the big flourishing of civil society movements in gender through things like the World Social Forum during the 1990s. The 1990s in a sense were a period, as many of you know, of great effervescence in civil society. The possibility coming out of what was the very hard period of the 1980s to one which looked much more full of promise. These, I mentioned the, why these global conferences um, carry so much resonance for us is because, in fact, um, they've set the agenda. They've shaped uh, uh, not just language, they're not some language that somebody agreed to in Cairo and Beijing. This is what governments overwhelmingly agreed to. This is what international donors and agencies agreed to and have tried to implement after that. The implementation by no means, by no means perfect. Implementation never is. Um, but the normative agenda is critical because if you don't have that normative frame, what are you going to implement? Or what is civil society going to argue needs to be Implemented. So these conferences were crucial um, through much of the 1990s. And then by, the, by 2000, we saw again a narrowing of the space. 2000, of course, it's the millennium. And we add the emergence of the, the big millennium summit, the coming together of global, to say, okay, what's our global agenda for the new millennium? Out of which were born two completely self-contradictory documents. One being the Millennium Declaration, 
which was produced at the summit, big, you know, and all presidents and whoever heads of state signed on to it, um, and which is expansive, forward looking, progressive, creative in how and built on what had been achieved through the conferences of the 90s, and the other being what we know of as the MDGs. The Millennium Development Goals, eight goals, um, narrowed down um, the conferences, of, the outcomes of the conferences of the 1990s, boiled down to a few targets and indicators, missing most of what had in fact been agreed to, but becoming the they want to on the basis of which from henceforward, governments, agencies, and so on, would shape their policies um, and would fund the program. So we see, you know, this continuous, when we look at the global arena, you can see even in the short period that I'm speaking about, how much of these pressures. And the Pacific, of course, is absolutely as vulnerable and open to all of it, particularly as a country that is very open to um, what international agencies um, um, and in India, somewhere in the middle of the, say around 2010, you could ask most people, what do the MPGs mean to you? Even if you ask them at the capital city and there were people who were very engaged in policy, they would tell you not very much. Probably that would be true for ordinary people in Fiji as well. But in fact, everybody who's working in the development sector would not say, they would say, oh, it shapes a great deal of what we're supposed to be doing. But of course, that depends very much on who it is, who's pushing what, etc. And some things are pushed, others are not. It's lopsided and so on. But it's not something one could ignore. The post-2015 development agenda that Millennium Development Goals Agenda was supposed to be a 15 year agenda going up to 2015. And over the last three years, we've been engaged in a, it sometimes it looks like a battle to death, um, um, to figure out what in fact will happen post 2015. What is going to be the nature of the development agenda after? 2015. Uh, will it be more of the same? And against the background, of course, now of a number of things. Um, advances on women's human rights that came out of the 1990s flourishing um, has been followed by backlashes um, everywhere, both in terms of funding, but also in terms of governments, in terms of um, what organizations and agencies are willing to do. Um, uh, the, um, 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 how do we ensure that in this post-2015 development agenda, everything that we understood as necessary for women's human rights out of the 1990s and out of the hard period of the 2000s doesn't get left behind and in fact shapes and supports us as we move in um, as we're moving forward. And this is in a, against the background of big South-North battles over the right to development versus human rights, so-called. Quite often, the so-called group of 77 South countries, which is many more than 77 at this point, um, saying we, we want the right to develop. Um, and please stop giving us all this human rights stuff that you keep talking about from the north. Um, for women, that puts you between a rock and a hard place. Because yes, as women from the south, we want a right to development. But a right to development for us doesn't just mean private sector rules all or financial globalization runs roughshod over societies. It means uh, embedded a right to development is embedded in all other human rights as well. Um, inequality and justice um, um, as well. Um, the, um, we are, this battle is going on right now also at a time when the so-called South countries, which used to be much more coherent 
in the earlier era of the 1980s is fractured. So you have the big guys from the South who um, would like to say solidarity but actually are looking to be part of the big players. So we've seen the emergence during this period of the so-called G20, um, which includes all of the big, uh, what I sometimes call the wannabes um, of, the global, uh, of the global economy. They all want to be part of it. My own country is very much part of it. China is part of it. The so-called BRICS, Brazil, um, South Africa, Russia, but there's a lot of others. Indonesia, Nigeria would love to be part of it, Mexico, you name it. There's a whole bunch of um, middle and upper middle income countries that want to both um, run with the hair and front with the house, um, so to speak. So their interests are not necessarily what used to be part of what could be called the coherent um, global interest going forward. Now when it comes to issues like climate change, this of course makes for a very serious problem. Um, the Pacific in terms of its interests in climate change, would like to would need to see very rapid reductions, not stabilization, but real reductions in carbon emissions. As we know, the North is the worst, um, and historically has been the worst in terms of the backlog of carbon emissions. But China and India are catching up. China is caught up. India is getting better quite quickly as well. And within India, one could well make the argument, who is it that is actually benefiting from these massive emissions of come? So what is it that, we, that holds, in fact, the BRICS countries, the Group of 20, the South in the Group of 20, and other parts of Group of 77 together? Equally, the North is fractured. The North might come together to argue against southern countries on civil and political rights. But Germany would not give one inch to Greece in terms of fiscal space or the, um, uh, the or pulling out of the crisis. They're willing to come as close as they can to coming off their nose to spike their face because the euro at this point is teetering on the verge of um, possible um, uh, possibly falling apart altogether. Um, and the new government in Greece cannot be relied upon to do what the old government did do, which is to say, okay, take your euro and stuff it, where are we here? Where are we here? Even, I mean, the pain can't be much worse than what we're already going through. Of course, the German answer to this is to say, we have been giving you so much in order for you to be able to repay your loans. The problem is, because of the nature of financialization and what I said earlier about who gets, gets first dibs on the payment, Um, who gets first dibs on payment? Almost everything that Greece has borrowed in the last couple of years has simply come in from the side and gone out from that side. It's simply been used to pay off the loans of the same German banks. So the German government gives aid to Greece to pay off the German banks. It doesn't, and meanwhile, the belts of ordinary Greek citizens have been tightened and tightened. Um, as an old feminist friend said long ago, actually back in Beijing, um, my uh, belt so tight at this point ain't got no more holes in it. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so we have, so there's a major factor in the north as well. Um, and uh, the ability to see that commonality is not so great. Um, What's the role of the Pacific in this globalized economy? There's a lot of things going on. The Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, when, um, when global civil society argued against the World Trade Organization and said that we can't have the world made free for trade without ensuring that the 
And yet we know that when societies start crumbling, because the state starts crumbling, because employment and jobs start crumbling, in fact, one of the places that pops up again is in violence. Violence between people, violence within communities, and very much violence against women within homes and within communities. Against women, against girls, um, 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 etc. Um, I just want to end um, today's discussion by simply saying that in recent um, discussions, the Pacific has been punching as a region way above its weight in regional and global negotiations for gender equality and women's human rights. Um, and certainly from where I sit um, and working with um, Dawn, um, we've tried to both work with uh, Pacific, certainly with Pacific civil society, but with Pacific governments as well, in order to ensure that the Pacific keeps punching above its weight. The Pacific has the moral high ground on climate change without question. But I think the Pacific has also been able to show that it has the moral high ground on issues of women's bodily integrity and autonomy, as well as on what are considered narrow economic issues of trade, investment, um, and fiscal, um, fiscal um, policy. Um, so I would hope that um, you would, um, Fiji, and Fiji's been a leader uh, at different points in that, so I would certainly hope that that is something that we will continue to see as we move forward. Thank you very much. Sorry for having taken so much.